Welcome to the very first panel at Digital Hollywood 2006, the year of online video. My name is Shelley Palmer. I'm chairman of the Advanced Media Committee for the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. We're the last people to bring in the Emmy Awards. I'm also uh, first vice president of the Television Academy, and my day job is uh, as managing director of Advanced Media Ventures Group, a strategic consulting firm. And I'm happy to moderate this panel today <coughs> on citizen media. I'm not quite sure what citizen media is. I thought all media was citizen media, but apparently there's, there are more, more uh, definitive ways to describe it. We're going to try and explore some of that today. The panel, <coughs> excuse me, the panel is an extraordinary panel, and I'm, I'm glad each of you could give us your time today, out of your busy schedule, to, to uh, <laughs> come and join us. What we're going to do is really simple. Uh, each panelist is going to do a couple of minutes of introduction about themselves, and then we're going to have what can only be described as a Socratic discussion about the issues amongst ourselves in an interactive and somewhat animated way. Those of you who know Jason from other panels know that there's nothing else that could happen if Jason's on the panel. It's going to be interactive and Socratic. Then, um, at the appropriate moment, we'll ask uh, each of you to uh, to join uh, in if you are so moved, and we'll talk, take your questions, and try to respond to them. And after that, we'll all go out for a beer, which was planned beforehand, but apparently now it's an after party. So, without further ado, well, we do have one small presentation uh, from, from JD. So, uh, why don't we start down the other side and end uh, from introductions, and we'll end with JD and do anything else. Are, does that make sense? Okay, so. Uh, Maria, could you just give us a couple seconds about who you are and all that? Sure, my name is Maria Thomas and I'm the Vice President and General Manager for NPR Digital Media. NPR stands for National Public Radio and I never assume that anyone in the audience knows what that is. Um, first of all, it's a non-profit, non-commercial organization. Uh, basically, it's a big media company as we like to think of ourselves these days. The, the little media company that could. Um, I run the online and on-demand operations, which includes the website and our mobile efforts, including podcasting. Thanks, Maria. Just, I'm Jed Albert, and I'm CEO of Mobile Commons and its subsidiary rights group that we'll be talking about mostly here. Mobile Commons is a mobile content platform that is uh, very geared towards uh, uh, individual users, organizations, presenting any kind of uh, media out over mobile phones, and rights group is uh, it's a subsidiary that's, uh, that's focused on uh, advocacy campaigns, uh, political causes, uh, cause marketing, and, and uh, has been the, sort of the fastest growing um, aspect of, of our business. We now have about uh, 50 clients ranging from the NRDC to Aveda to uh, working assets, uh, various political committees around the country, uh, and campaigns, uh, and our, our, our are driving a lot, a lot of traffic and activism over mobile phones. The, uh, we got our start in this business uh, first starting in um, uh, mobile entertainment and uh, uh, representing clients such as uh, in the mobile areas such as Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake and Visa and Pepsi. And kind of as a lark, we, uh, we took one of our applications that we built for Britney Spears horoscopes and used it for advocacy around uh, people for the American Way issue. And what we found was that using mobile phones in connection with advocacy garnered pretty much the highest response rates we've ever seen for anything ever. Um, if, 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 when you compare it with direct mail, email, anything we've ever worked on, it, the, somehow the combination of a cause-related message and, 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 mobile, and the mobile phone generated just huge, huge impact. So the, the, the business really moved from there, and now we're developing um, a number of other verticals. Thanks so much. Hey, my name is Ted Shelton. I'm the CEO and founder of Personal B. We're a distributed media platform for news, for news aggregation and redistribution. Uh, the point of our product is to allow people to step up and be editors of topics that they are passionate about or knowledgeable about or both, uh, and then take that news that they've aggregated and published and take it to their communities. Wow, Dean. I'm Dean Wright. I'm the managing editor of Consumer Services at Reuters, which uh, certainly makes me a representative of media, I suppose, and uh, in many ways the uh, uh, the only Victorian internet news company. Uh, since Reuters has been around a long time, since uh, the days when they used carrier pigeons to deliver stock quotes, um, 
innovation has always been at the, at the heart of what we try to do, which is why we're very interested in citizen media, so-called citizen media, and breaking down the boundaries between uh, the so-called mainstream media and so-called citizen media. Um, we believe that editors, a big part of an editor's job is to be a moderator um, of debate and to be able to bring the global conversations that are taking place around the world to our users. So I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion. Fantastic. Thank you. Jason? Hi, I'm Jason Calcanis. I'm a serial entrepreneur. You may know me from Silicon Valley Reporter and Digital Coast Reporter back in the day, uh, and Venture Reporter, uh, which was sold to Dow Jones. You may know me through my blog at calacanis.com or Weblogs Inc., which is a company I co-founded with Brian Alvey, uh, which produces blogs like Engadget, Autoblog, TV Squad, Cinematica, Luxus, etc. And we sold that to America Online last year. It's a citizen journalist uh, organization that has two or three hundred bloggers paid to blog uh, and was purchased by uh, AOL Time Warner. And uh, this year I uh, took over as general manager of Netscape.com and have relaunched the uh, brand as a social news site uh, where users vote stories up and down. Uh, but it's not simply a social news site where people have voted up and down like delicious Reddit or Dig. Uh, we've added an editorial layer to that. Uh, eight traditional journalists who will take any story which makes the homepage and then do meta journalism on that. Uh, and we talk about what meta journalism is, uh, I guess, for the panel. Thanks, Jason. Um, JD, I want you to say who you are for a minute and then you can go through your presentation and we'll have our discussion. Okay, we do that. Uh, I'm Jay Lask, I'm the co-founder of Our Media, and I'm a little bit bummed that we can't really move this out to the pool or to the, the beach, but maybe after the panel we go. And I've already uh, hit up my old friend Jason here, and we've sort of struck a, a, a business deal already before the panel began, so who knows what can happen by the other day. Um, so um, I've been flying around all over the place over the past year just talking about citizen media, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what it is, and then tell you just a little bit about our media. Um, I think almost everybody here is pretty well grounded in uh, traditional media, legacy media, media 1.0, it's sort of, you know, your mainstream uh, media, traditional media from newspapers, magazines, to, uh, to uh, television. Um, it's one way, it's sort of centralized, top down, and kind of summed up by Bill O'Reilly here. <laughs> Well, shut up line has happened only once in six years. You really know what I'm doing? Shut up, 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 shut up. So that's big media. Um, and now we're moving into this new era of participatory media. Um, I've been sort of shying away from the term citizen media, so, you know, it's, it actually goes by a lot of names. So citizen media, participatory media, user-generated media. Just don't, I, I don't like user-generated content, though, so, so stay away from that, please. Um, there are lots of different uh, platforms for this kind of stuff. So everything from uh, Oh My News, which is one of the oldest um, uh, participatory media sites out of South Korea. They're about six and a half years old now. Everybody knows Wikipedia and what they're doing. It's really cool stuff. Uh, photo sharing sites, uh, video, video sites. Um, blogging started 10 years ago. But now it's sort of turning into this multimedia, rich media kind of movement. So same kind of growth curve that we saw with uh, with text, uh, with blogging, is now happening with, with uh, videos, happening with podcasts, you're seeing the same kind of real steep uh, takeoff. Uh, community sites like Slashdot probably be grouped under participatory media. Uh, one of the really interesting things that's happening right now is all these sort of little, little community sites that are springing up. Um, it goes by different names, um, I'm calling them place sites. But uh, there are now six, over 600 of them that have uh, sprung up, and there are usually like two or three people who are really passionate about covering something that's happening in their community, and they feel that uh, big media is not doing a good enough job, that newspapers are underserving the local population, so that they go out and just create their own um, site. And now that the blog platforms are so easy to have set up, um, you're seeing these spring up all over, all over the place. Um, really briefly, our media is a uh, participatory media site that is about uh, sharing any kind of uh, digital media that you create. So if you 
if you have a digital story that you have to tell or a podcast or something else that you've created, we'll, we'll store it for free, give you free bandwidth, and preserve it forever for free. It's an open source media project. We have 115,000 members. Um, you know, I, I, I sh probably should have said this. Is there anybody from Google here? Because um, I'm sort of getting a little bit tired of the media just calling this whole revolution um, a YouTube revolution. And it's, it's a lot more than that. There are 250 different video hosting sites out there. YouTube should be congratulated in, um, at what they've been able to pull off in making uploading video really simple and easy. But uh, there's a lot more to it uh, than that. Um, our media, we're a nonprofit. Um, I think we're worth approximately $1.65 billion, less than YouTube at this point. But um, we do a lot of things different from YouTube. We, we make sure that whenever you uh, upload a work in media, you have to assign rights to it so everybody knows exactly how you're allowed to use that work. You know, we really love Creative Commons. Um, every YouTube doesn't have you assign rights? No, they, they take the rights. <laughs> for the most part. Yeah, I know exactly. Kind of hard to assign well, people don't read terms of service. You know, I think we should get into this a little bit later. Um, everything is downloadable, all that kind of cool stuff. So, um, anyway, just check it out at some point. Um, here are some of the kinds of things that we're seeing on our side and we're seeing on other social media sites. Um, I, didn't, I didn't even know what stop motion photography was five months ago. Now there's an entire genre being built up of people taking their little digital cameras and just creating little movies through iPhoto or iMovie. Um, animation is really taken off. You're going to start seeing this stuff on some of the mainstream media sites, on, on network television, music videos, citizen journalism. Uh, digital storytelling is a great new genre of people telling their own uh, personal stories and community stories. Everybody knows about Flickr and all the great stuff. I'm a, I'm a real big fan of these uh, political mashups that we're starting to see. Um, just two quick last things. We, we just launched recently a personal media learning center. So anybody who wants to learn anything about how to create a video blog, how to create a podcast, what is screencasting, um, how to do all this kind of stuff with audio and multimedia and video and, and photographs, you can just come to the site, rmedia.org slash learning center, and uh, you'll see this stuff. And you can also repurpose it if you've got your own site and you want to just borrow this stuff and put it up on your own site just to help people learn how to do all the stuff, you can do that. And last thing, um, part of the Learning Center is this open media directory that we just built. I think it's the, the web's deepest resource for learning how to create, um, for actually being able to access video and music and put it in your own work. So if you've got a podcast and you want to use some music in it, if you've got um, a, a video or a movie that you want to create and you want to put a soundtrack to it, you can go to dozens of these different sites, just click through and find out what the terms are. And usually it's a lot of really cool independent music and all they want to do is have some credit for it. So that's my spiel. Um, I would love for you guys to get a hold of me and I'm looking forward to talking about this. That's awesome. Thanks, JD. So welcome, those of you who were late. No, I'm just kidding. It's not your fault. <laughs> I understand the traffic is insane at the parking lot and there's a large group registering. Um, <clears throat> for those who came late, the, the panel's just introduced themselves. What we're going to do is we're going to have a, uh, a little discussion now, pretty much on the topic. Um, when I was researching my book, uh, Television Disrupted, I was really fascinated by the tool sets that were available on the internet. I mean, literally hundreds of tool sets for the distribution of any of the things JD just described, any of the way you want to describe it, user-generated content, user-created content, however you want to think about it, um, citizen media. And I was all excited about all the tools that we get to use. I mean, really thrilled about it, right up until the time when I happened upon a story about the Civil, uh, the Revolutionary War in 1770. And here they used a bunch of social networks uh, to not only incite people to overthrow King George, but to pick up arms, risk their lives, and risk being thrown in jail for treason. Uh, and they had absolutely no technology except the printing press and uh, clay pipes and beer. And a lot of beer. They must have had a lot of beer because that, at the time that must have been an insane thing to think through. So as I, I sort of got very excited about technology until I realized that the technology had nothing whatsoever to do with social networking or how powerful ideas get from place to place. The thing that to start talking about is, is the sociology of blog mobs, of, of the way people who are not local to one another now can use 
this technology not only to to create what seems to be a blog uh, a mob consciousness, but also the speed with which it works, and how that may and or may not impact the world we're living in. Take it out of the business model for a minute and think just about the value, not the wealth, that's created. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about about how that is. I'd like to start, Maria, Maria, if you could just, from the NPR perspective, here you are being the, the one to many voice of the public. Are you seeing the communities of interest form around that content that has social social context, or is it art context, or is it is there a sociological change coming from this that that one would predict, or is it not happening? Um, it is happening. What we haven't done uh, yet at NPR.org is sort of capture that and present it publicly. Um, when I say it's happening, I can tell you about a couple of experiments that you could find at NPR.org and see for yourself. Um, but I can also tell you that most of where I see it happening is in the email, the tens of thousands of emails that we receive every week. Um, so that's really what I mean when I say I think it's happening, but we haven't sort of figured out exactly how to present it. Earlier, uh, before all of you arrived, or before many of you arrived, Jason was suggesting when we thought the audience was smaller, <coughs> that we might just have a discussion and um, the panel would offer up advice. Well, I'd actually like to hear from the panel and all of you uh, what you think NPR's position in this world might be. Um, there's a lot of thinking going on inside of NPR about it. Uh, a couple of examples I would point to, um, and these are relatively small. Incidentally, I'll speak for NPR, and then I'll tell you about some other examples that are going on more broadly in public broadcasting across the whole industry of public radio. Um, so we've seen a couple of things that are interesting in the music area. Um, we have a, a an online-only program called All Songs Considered, which was born out of the music in between the, the segments on the news shows. Um, there was so much curiosity about what that music is that we generated an entire show about it. Uh, it's been online for, uh, hard to believe, five years now. Uh, it's, you, you never hear it on the radio. It has uh, actually a fairly significant audience now. We estimate that the audience for All Songs Considered might be larger than many of the small market station, radio stations across the NPR network. Um, with the growing popularity of all songs considered, we've, uh, we've launched probably a year and a half ago something called Open Mic. And Open Mic is uh, a place uh, online where independent artists can upload their MP3s um, to the staff of, of all songs considered, which is one and a half people. And those uh, MP3s get listened to each week. Mm -hmm. and and one is selected for presentation online. And then so those are all situations where you're yeah. controlling sure. what what you're expecting the, sure. the, the citizens to yeah. do. We have to have a name for them. Users I hate. So audience. People, yeah. audience. Well, I'm more interested in, in where you are, where all of us are, giving control back to the consumers. So, so I think that's where I was saying up front that I don't think we're actually doing that. I see that the audience is engaged. And I see it in email, in tens, tens of thousands of emails a week. Um, we see uh, an intelligent audience, you know, either uh, offering corrections very quickly or offering suggestions about how to further that story or what, how to take off from one story to the next. How to capture that is another thing and how to present it. Minnesota Public Radio, which is uh, both a network unto itself and also a care member station, has launched something a year ago called Public Insight Journalism. Um, public insight journalism uh, has some of the same features as, uh, as our media, um, but basically Minnesota is registering uh, with permission it, its users and what their expertise are, what their different expertises are, and then with permission contacting those audience members when they're putting content together. So if they decide to do um, a story about you know pharmaceutical industry, yeah, and, and experts have, groups. Pardon? Right, experts. Experts. There's, there's, there's a lot so there. there's a few experiments going on around the public radio system. There's nothing um, either at NPR or in the system more broadly that I would say is you know sort of a scalable uh, s systematic effort. Jen, what about from where you, you guys are? So, well, the the uh, I mean, one thing we found is that um, given the opportunity, I agree with you. It's not really about social networks. Aren't about the technology. There's always been a lot of social networks. And but the, that, that when people, particularly at live events, like at, say, a dark floor rally or at a political campaign or at a, at a, at a YouTube concert, have the opportunity to, to uh, at that moment, opt in and become part of something, 
that, that different networks and, um, and views form around the people who opt in. So uh, that, that, are, that are different than people who join up for the internet. For, so for example, in one of these programs, uh, the organizations hear a lot about sort of the immediate needs that we, what, what, what the, uh, the, the, the participant, the person who's opted in or, or, or joined up, what kind of information they immediately want, what, what's immediately important to them, and um, it, allows, it allows organizations to be very, very responsive on an immediate level. Uh, you know, one example is uh, for, and this is more around what I would call activism than uh, 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 citizen journalism, but for, for example, with, with the ACLU, we've created an application that allows people who are in immediate legal problem or immediate legal jeopardy or having a, an experience with a police officer to send a, a text message saying busted that immediately replies back with what they should do and then it, it allows you to be further interactive from there. Um, but do you have like opt-in uh, GPS phone distribution where you can now create a blog mob and go, go bust some heads? Well, we don't use GPS because well, it's not like available, but, but, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we've gotten that very localized now to even the point of the zip code to do um, organizing, uh, organizing at a very local level, you know, encourage people to, to bust heads. No, I'm not saying it, but there was, a, there was a whole thing a couple of years back, right at the very beginning of SMS, where people were doing text mobs. Right. And, and it, was a, it was a pretty, actually it was really interesting, it was during the last major political election. Yeah, but during, during the RNC in New York. They, yeah, yeah. Tech, but those were not, those, were, those happened very organically and were, and, and were very interesting. What's, and, and now, sort of around particular organizations, whether it's a client of ours who's a union who's, who's engaged in strike activity or organization activity or a client who's an environmental group, it's, it's sort of allowed, you know, but I'll give you one more example, which is we've created something called mobile, mobile immediate response, where say some right-wing person is on, is on the air talking about how global warming doesn't exist. We've allowed a group to form that's Would a, that be a right wing position? It's a, a, a I'm just, I'm just kidding. Yeah, just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Light up. It's just a light up. It, it's a branch of the right wing, perhaps. But the uh, but we through one of these organizations like the NRDC or Conservation International or or the Sierra Club, a group is formed sure. that say two hundred people that are well informed. We, we will text them that radio station two hundred people, that radio station phone number, or route them through our IVR service to give them talking points. All of a sudden, the next 200 callers, which is a sort of self-selected group, but they're using the, uh, I don't know if this answers the question exactly, but they're using the, the, well, the facility of the It's interesting that you're doing it. It would be far more interesting if someone else, uh, uh, if a consumer, if you were a listener, audience member, was empowered to make that happen by themselves. That was hard to Well, the other thing is that, that, that they, are, they are, through the through the tools, they are empowered to do it themselves under the, um, under the umbrella of the organization. I agree with you. It would be interesting if you do it themselves, but... But these these um, these advocacy groups don't sort of exist in the ether. There there there, there are um, you know, you know, are there mirror the reflections of the groups that are that are offline? Well, they the, the groups that are off yes, and the groups that are offline are um, heavily influenced by now that the input that their constituents are getting. It was never the case that um, these large these large groups like. You know, see, and that, 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 not never the case, but it was more rarely the case that they that that they could be so responsive to the 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 input of their of, of their members and their constituents in the same way. But it doesn't exist. You know, from, no, no, I, I, I understand. understand that. That. So, by the way, other panel members can jump in at any time and for any reason and say anything to anyone because I want this to be as interactive as possible. Jason, I, yeah, sure, go ahead. Sure, I was going to ask another question. Uh, before we just the I want to sort of get back to Maureen's point about uh, advice for NPR and if. Nothing else comes out of this panel. Perhaps we could have some historic uh, you know, change happening here. Um, my suggestion to NPR would be to uh, to loosen up a little, to let your content go, to uh, to you know forget about this kind of Hollywood like control over all of your stuff. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Uh, con control, just the idea that, so, so for example, six months ago, we, I personally contacted NPR and I asked whether we can showcase some of the podcasts on NPR on the R Media homepage, and I was told no, <coughs> we don't allow that on any other sites, and it has to all go through NPR.org. And I think the entire idea of what's happening with the web over the past couple of years has always been about 
uh, just the distributed nature of letting your content go, getting it out there, your public resource. Uh, look what BBC is doing with Citizen Media. You know, it's like they're they're almost the world leaders in what they're doing, and it's. I don't know why we can't do the equipment. Well, but Jay, Jay, in everybody's defense, that is the actual transition that we're going through, period, right? The question is, who are the brand police? Is it the consumer, or is it the brand police of the corporation? And the brand, it's always been the consumer, but now the consumers can really can really be heard in a way they, they couldn't before. I don't know what that means exactly, but um, you know, the point is, uh, if it's a public resource like PBS or NPR, um, the public owns that content, not those people, uh, and the, the, that content should be given to the public to remix and reuse uh, in a non-commercial way. You are obligated to do that. Get, I knew this would get it. Right. But I mean, BBC, <laughs> but anyway. So, so who knows where NPR's budget comes from? Cable companies. <laughs> Partially right. No, but that's, that's correct, actually. It's a, it's a for-profit organization that, that ends up as a non-profit Right, you got the production company. NPR is for profit. NPR is non for profit, but it is right. a production and distribution company. And when all of you make your kind donations, you're making them to your local member station. That's right. Which, of course, indirectly benefits us, but directly our money comes from about half from the program fees that stations pay to us for the programs that we make. And those fees are based on audience size, as rated by Arbitron. And then the other half comes from two sources about 35 to 40 percent from corporate underwriting, corporate sponsorship, um, and then the remainder from philanthropic foundations. So, and just, viewers just, like you. And, 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 yeah, <laughs> listeners. Uh, well, <laughs> listeners donate to the stations, right. and then in turn, the station is paying NPR for programming. The stations may have multiple social sources of funding, some of which we don't have, just for clarification. And I'm so, sure there's multiple yeah. content membership. Some people. Some of the local stations own the content, some of the content makers own the content. Right, so let, let's not make this about public broadcasting because that's going to light me up in a way that I'm going to start doing a whole diatribe about why it shouldn't exist and I'll get yelled at by a lot of people. <laughs> let, me, let me take this another direction. Um, I know Jason has a lot of thoughts on this subject as we've had this conversation before. Filtration versus thought leadership and how the blogosphere self-regulates where you get gatekeepers and where you don't. A lot of the information is overwhelmingly not filtered. Um, not in a gadget, obviously, that's overwhelmingly filtered, but the, the, no, the main blogosphere is astoundingly okay. unfiltered. No, no, the gadget's not filtered. I mean, the, the bloggers there are free to say whatever they want. I mean, the whole concept of why blogging even exists is because people wanted something that was more acoustic and that uh, didn't have editing. And knowing that uh, the person who wrote the post got to hit the publish key is really the value proposition of blog. So actually all of our blogs are unfiltered in that way. I mean, a blogger can request an, the help of another blogger and say, hey, would you proofread this for me? That does happen, but that's more of a symbiotic, you know, opt-in kind of a thing. So, it was my wrong word, Jason. It, you wouldn't let somebody stay in Gadget who was writing stuff that was patently false or wrong, would you? Uh, no, we, we don't uh, accept lying. Uh, if that's what you're asking. So, well, I am. Yeah. Uh, they, they so, were, but they also, were the blog is here self correcting in that if somebody did lie uh, or gave you something that was corrupt, uh, you basically get made to look like the evil fool that you are. Um, so, there is a self correcting mechanism. If, you're, if you lie, you, you get bounced very quickly. So Jason, who chooses the bloggers? And, and get it. Who gets to choose them? Um, we hire a lot of the readers, but we, we, we hire them. Who, who's the we? So we would be our company. Okay, so there's there's like an editorial board. There's a, a person. It's Jason. Yeah, we get we get submissions from brother people. that decides who gets to be in the gadget blog. Yes, because this is the point, right? Because you you do fundamentally then have an editorial board who's making a choice and who's controlling what the reader can read or or, or the viewer can view, right? Um, yeah, but you we, know what you're saying. I'm like, just, just going back to Shelley's point about saying the blogosphere at large is completely unfiltered. Yeah. Whereas you are filtered. You decide who no. gets to be a blogger on a gadget. No, that's that's. That's intellectually dishonest, what you're saying. You're just trying to be... No, no, no. You're just trying to be contrarian. The, the fact is that oh, people... Well, I'll explain well, 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 Let me finish my statement. Because I don't I understand know. that well. Well, you don't. Um, the way it works is, you know, we have one property, but the blogosphere is absolutely open. We have open comments, and people can start their own blog. So, you know, the, the whole concept is that anybody can do this. It's an absolutely level playing field. And what happens is the people who are not good at creating content and not good at generating audience complain that there's some kind of an A-list 
or that there is some kind of control in place. I'm not in control. Yes, we hire bloggers to work on our blogs, but that doesn't stop anybody else from creating a blog. Well, I actually wasn't complaining. I was just making an no, observation. No, I'm just saying yeah, well, there, the there, the there is an A-list debate that goes on, and it goes something like this. There's A-list bloggers, and they control the bloggers. It's the stupidest debate ever. If you want to be an A-list blogger, I can tell you how to do it in 30 days. You go to a site called TechMeme. TechMeme syndicates all the discussions of the quote-unquote A-list bloggers. Pick the top story on TechMeme every day. Write something halfway intelligent about the top story every day for 30 days. Link to three or four of the other people and comment about what they're saying, and you are now an A-list blogger in 30 days. And come to one event every month, you're now an A-list blogger. It is the most open platform ever. There are tons of people who become A-list bloggers who were nobody's five, nobody's. So like really nobody five, that, year ago, that, five that, years ago. That's not really the point, because in, a, in a, something as cut and dried as this widget is a good widget, this widget's a bad widget, this piece of software is good, this is bad, this piece of software, the religion behind C Sharp, or the religion behind Fortran, um, th th those things to some level are amazingly self-regulating. Let's talk about things that don't self-regulate. A woman's right to choose. Afghanistan's borders well, Iraq and there. What does have to do with blogging? And, well, it has everything to do with blogging because the I social. Don't understand your point. The social consciousness. The social consciousness can be very affected by completely unfiltered text. You have thousands of people blogging about every subject, right. and they don't all self-regulate quite the way. That, that a tech site would self-regulate. In fact, the more social the issue, the more personal the issue, the more subjective the issue, the less likely there is to be any filtration of meaning whatsoever. And so that, that becomes really interesting when you start looking at things that are written as uh, sources of news. Well, I mean, the fact that you're looking at it as news is the first mistake. It's just people's opinion. It's not news. It's a conversation. A blog is somebody's voice. So the fact is people ascribe a little bit too much to blogging sometimes. They make it into news and it's competitive with the New York Times. It, when you say blog, you're basically saying paper. <coughs> when you can make toilet paper, a newspaper, a magazine, or a, a brochure out of paper. You can do anything with these blogs. So you can sort of, there's the news blogs, there is the opinion blogs, there are the liar blogs, there are the marketer evil, paper post, die, 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 stuff of the air blogs. There are all different types of blogs out there. And so, you know, you, it's this very sweeping generalization as to what happens with blogs, but the fact is, it's the most open media, most open media platform ever created. Everybody gets a voice, and so when people start saying like, "Oh my God, you know, it's regulated," or you know, there's noise, whatever. Of course, there's noise. It's going, it's like going to a dinner party. You have 20 people discussing something at a dinner party. Somebody could be an idiot. Somebody could be an expert. Somebody could be a politician. And somebody could be a marketer. And somebody could just be an average Joe. And it's up to the individual to take all these people's opinions and say, yes, you're an idiot, yes, you're an expert, and yes, you're an average show, and yes, you're a marketing person. And it's up to the individual to filter these things. I'd also say that it could be up to the mainstream media to help listen to the noise and try to make some news go from time to time. Uh, you know, it's not all noise. I mean, it is all noise. Some noise is more pleasing than others. Some noise makes more sense than others. Yeah. Uh, and I think we in the mainstream media do have a responsibility to, to, to listen to these conversations and, and wrap them around our coverage. Uh, and I, I might think that one thing we can do in the MSM, which is a phrase that I hate, but uh, is, is to, with our reporting, essentially provide what I like to call the, the, the spine of truth around which conversations kind of evolve. Um, then I think we're doing a service um, and, and, and not co-opting the blogosphere and not trying to take it over, but um, but playing a role in bringing those conversations to all our individual youth or individual members of the mainstream media. Just for clarity's purpose, I just want to say I read that every day. Um, and I'm not meaning to pick on you in any way, or to say that Engadget or your model is wrong. Um, but I do think that there's this very interesting thing that happens with Engadget, and happens with Reuters, and happens with mainstream media, in which there is a decision point uh, that is not the reader about what gets published, right? And 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 look, I'm pointing out that Engadget at some point. Wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait let me finish, Jason. There's there's a point at some point in which 
uh, a publication, a, a, a blog becomes a publication instead of being a blog. There's, there's a single voice blog, there's a multi-voice blog. At the point in which you have a multi-voice blog, you have a decision point about which voices get to be heard. And that's not what I think, but, I, but I'd like to take it one step further and say what I think is one of the things that we're all uh, talking about right now is who is the editor, right? And the point that I think Shelley was making that I was piling on is that at some level, there's an editorial voice being expressed in who the blogger is. At Reuters, there's an editorial voice that's very explicit. And in Gadget, it's implicit in who the voices are that have been selected. But it is in neither of those cases, the editorial voice is the reader, which is a really interesting transformation I think is going on in the marketplace right now, because we're going from a world in which we assume, uh, and we've all grown up in a world in which there's this industrial media. That is, there is a, a sausage factor. The news comes in at one end and it gets turned into a sausage for us to consume at the other end. And that world is changing. In fact, I argue, and I think, you're, you're, Shelley, you were right to bring up 1776, because what we're actually returning to is a much more natural state that, that we, we suffered for the last 200 years in a world that the technology, because it has a very small pipe, I get mad at NPR. I love NPR, but I yell at the radio now, and it makes me mad to listen to it because there's no feedback mechanism. I can't interact the way I can at Engadget. I can't talk back to what's going on. And that world is going to end. The, the one-way sausage factory world is going to end, and the fact that we all can be editors of the news that we read is going to be the thing, and, or that we can choose our editors. So I can say, hey, you're a great editor, or you're a great editor, and I'm gonna choose you as my editors and pay attention to you. The point, the point the is also that right now, we're talking about one form factor, which is blogs, but that's truly a disservice to the whole concept because a blog is only one way you might get your information and about it. If you go to Google and you, well, this great site, Blogging Beirut, you're going to end up on YouTube and then you're going to see four or five videos that are shot firsthand by people with video cameras that are, you know, at ground zero. Um, watching rockets get shot both in Lebanon and in Israel. I got to tell you something. No matter which side you're on, when a rocket falls, it's not the art is really interesting, but it's terrifying, and you can start you can color that a lot of different ways. So now, good guys and bad guys totally decide are are, are based on who you think you're siding with, um, unless you're with me, which is a more a bad idea altogether. In which case, that's a third place you could be. But one one way or the other, they look a lot alike. The the rocket um, the, the exploded and destroyed the house on either side of the border pretty much look the same. So. Reuters would do a great job filtering that for, for me, but maybe not for someone else. There's so many ways to get unfiltered data right now. It is the first time in a couple hundred years where you didn't have the Sulzbergers, no offense, Arthur, don't be mad at me, or somebody else telling you what you're supposed to read. So anyway, let's, let's move the, off this subject for a second and move on to the, to the other part of this conversation, which is business versus passion. One of the things that makes all citizen media interesting is that people who are super passionate about things have a place, a, democ a democratized distribution methodology to, to voice their passions. And then there are some people who like to you know, try to make a business out of it. And we're constantly fighting between the commercial, uh, there's this concept, obviously, where uh, it's very easy to create wealth on the internet. and has been from the very first moment the internet happened. It has been usually interesting, uh, easy to create wealth. I am is a lot of wealth. It's the messenger is, is a lot of value rather. It creates a lot of value, but not any wealth that anyone can really lay their hands directly on. It needs to be part of a much bigger ecosystem to generate wealth. Many things on the internet have a lot of value, and they don't translate easily into wealth. And so, how does one take one's passion and create a business out of it? Or more importantly, should do these things need to uh, exist just totally separately? Citizen media. Is that just going to be a nice, is that a good hobby? Is that where we are? Is there a business here? Is it some hybrid model? Is there something that we need to worry about uh, as people in the media business? Anybody? Yeah, can I, I'll jump in there. Um, I wanted to suggest that I think we're at a really interesting point in this whole revolution. So I think phase one of the participatory media revolution has been about uh, being able to get your voice out there, to be able to publish, and to reach a global audience, to have this just giant um, global distribution platform. Um, okay, that's cool. Now we're entering phase two, and I think we, we need to go beyond that. Um, you know, we can only watch so many lip-syncing videos on YouTube before it sort of gets a little tiring. So, so I think some of the things that are happening, we're starting to see already is, number one, uh, people are starting to figure out some different business models around this kind of stuff. So. Um, they're either trying to attach advertisements to their podcasts or to their RSS feeds or to their videos. Um, some, some of it's going to work, some of it isn't. 
Um, they're finding other ways to uh, generate some revenues. Um, I, I think we're still at a really early point and probably the, the best business models haven't been created yet. I think we're going to see a lot more collaboration. So instead of just individuals doing this in their bedrooms, um, you're going to be seeing people who are trying to create some more serious, uh, deep, and meaningful videos and other kinds of works that are going beyond uh, inter internet distributions and it's probably going to wind up on you know your local um, TV or, um, or NPR even. Um, the third thing is um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of really interesting kind of Web 2.0 applications that are really easy to plug into some of this kind of stuff. So, so there's a service called .sub.com, which you probably not have heard of, um, which lets you translate any video into any of 200 different languages, and you can see the subtitle running across the bottom in Arabic or Russian or Chechen. Uh, there's, a, there's a site called Motionbox, which lets you uh, do deep tagging within the video. So if you want to watch a 30 minute video, you just want to go to the two minutes that are of interest to you, you'll be able to just click on a link and go right to that part of the video. So, so there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's happening right now, and I think we need to sort of get beyond the point of you know, this discussion about filters, for example, I, I, I want filters. I think, you know, 70,000 videos a day coming onto YouTube, I want to know what are the dozen that might be of interest to me. So I want to see somebody in this audience or somebody out there create a service that's going to hook me up to like-minded people or my colleagues or my friends that can recommend the ones that I think would be of interest. But those are two different things, right? Top 10 lists have been around forever, and so, it's a question of if your community of interest is exhibiting behaviors like watching certain videos more than others, and some collaborative filtration occurs, that's one approach. And then the other is the, the, the human intervention editorial approach, totally separate. Um, just, just to follow your thought exactly, and I don't want to take this a step further, there really are only three business models that I'm aware of, and maybe someone else can give me a fourth if you can, I'm all ears. I pay, you pay, someone else pays. That's pretty much the three business models there are in the world. Um, I'm almost, if there's a fourth, I've never found it. There's the combinations. I think the government supports it. The government supports it, right? Well, <laughs> no, they're definitely but supports. that's someone else pays, which is indirectly me, <laughs> with my tax dollars or unless I'm really laying, which is I don't pay tax dollars, no, I can't go there. It's, you know, it's a worthwhile and direct model, because I think there are things that are worthwhile that, are, that get supported because of social good. And so I think it is worthwhile. Thing. And especially things like our, our media, it's not really one of those three. It's really, it's, I think it is worthwhile to say there is this fourth model, which is that we as a society all agree. It's a thing that needs to be supported. But if we as a society agree it needs to be supported, money comes from either me, you, or someone else. No, people can do it. It's a worthwhile time. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile You can do it on your own. And that's the thing about this is it's not mostly about money for people. People do this for recognition and affiliation and, and our research, and we actually do research on this when we talk to bloggers. It's recognition, affiliation, and a very distant third is compensation. And what we learned was having hired 500 bloggers in the last three years and paid literally millions of dollars to bloggers in the last three years. Uh, we probably paid more money to bloggers than anybody except Google AdSense. Um, it's true. Uh, is uh, the compensation is a way for them to justify spending more time on it. They're not doing it for the money. I mean, now, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Now I'm going to push back. Information is currency and time is money. Now, whether they're getting paid in time, that it's an opportunity because there's dollars involved. Whether you, they're hard dollars or soft dollars really doesn't matter for this economic discussion. I don't know exactly what that means, but I can tell you what the bloggers say. Recognition, affiliation, distant third compensation. That's what they but tell us But that's the business opportunity you identified. That, someone, yeah. that recognition is a form of currency for them so that you can you're running a business owned yeah. by AOL, and it's a good business, but then someone's getting paid in recognition, and then you can generate dollars off of it. No, that's a great business. business. Yeah, that's, that's a great business, uh, actually. Um, and, but you and know, and the thing about the business model, your original question was about the business model. And for many people, this isn't a business uh, for them, it's a passion. For those of them who need to make a living, it can become a business, but you know, a lot of people are getting obsessed with doing something innovative in the business model, and it's frankly a waste of time. The, the business model on the internet is very clearly advertising, and it works. And Google AdSense is the most efficient app medium, advertising medium ever created in the history of advertising. It has the highest margins, and is the most effective for the advertiser. That's not going to change for the next 20 or 30 years. So given that, anybody can make a business out of the, the internet and creating content, and if you don't make a business out of it, it's because your content is not good. And that's 
plain and simple. You don't need a, to be a rocket scientist. You don't need venture capital. You know, people really overthink this. If you make great content, the way the system is built right now, it will be recognized and go right to the top. And everybody wants to talk about filters or innovating on the business model. It's absolutely not necessary. You make a great product, the audience comes, Google Adsets monetizes it in the short term, and direct ad sales will monetize it in the long term. It works. There's nothing broken about it, and it requires zero innovation. What it requires is great content. If you make a great video, how, are, how am I going to know that one, that one video out of the 70,000 is the one I want to see that? How do you, how do you know it's like, there? Like anything else, if you make something great, you tell 10 people about it. If it's truly great, they will pass so it on. If it's not great, they will not pass it on. To, 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 uh, I'm going to make and it. If you do it consistently well. I mean, this is, this is not like, new. This is not a new thing. A new movie business worked this way. Every, they're called hits. Well, no, but the, those businesses didn't work that way. That's, that's the thing you guys are missing. The movie business had control distribution. There is no control distribution on the internet, so that's actually the, the worst possible corollary to make. You, the, the movie studios control distribution from head to toe, and producing a movie is extraordinarily expensive. Producing stuff on the internet is A, cheap, and B, there is absolutely no distribution. That's the difference. If you make something great, it rises to the top. No amount of filters is going to hold back somebody who produces consistently great stuff. So, so I'd like to make it a, a, an admiring, positive comment that might be perceived and corrected because it's perhaps, <laughs> a little bit against your thesis. But I, but, I, but I guess I would say, um, who made more money uh, at, at uh, Weblogs Inc., the bloggers or the people that own Weblogs Inc.? Who, that economic model didn't work for the people that were creating the content. It worked for the people that created the infrastructure in which those content creators could operate within. Do you those know people that? made a lot more money. Do you know that? Uh, I, no, I, I, I believe it though from the news reports, and actually, I, it is an admiring comment. I think you created a great business model, uh, and you made it successful. And uh, what, wait, wait, wait. So, actually, I think there's an interesting question here. I think a lot of people focus on the content creator as a place where value creation can occur, and I think that's wrong. I think it's actually an aggregation and presentation that, con that that monetization is possible. And a lot of contents can be created because of passion. Right, it's the aggregation yeah. presented because of the economic market. Shall, shall I answer the question? Please. Um, the people who worked on it did make money, uh, and they did make a lot more money than when they were blogging uh, for nothing. So, uh, and they all freely joined that system. Now, you don't have to join that system. That's one of the great things. You can, as a blogger, choose to go on your own and make your own blog and own your brand, and not take and take all the risk on and make no money for a couple of years. As a blogger, you can go work for Weblogs Inc., Gawker, New York Times, have blogs, etc., and you can not have equity and upside and get paid up front and take no risk. Or you, you know, you can go partner with somebody like Federated Media or Blog Ads, and that's the beauty of the system is you have multiple choices. So for you to make it out to like, you know, we, you know, made money and nobody else did is just simply A not true. And B, people have choice. So you're sort of acting as if people didn't have a choice. People can vote and take whatever choice critical. they want. Okay. Well, let's move on. This is this is sort of a circular. This is a historic argument. It's not a not a new one. Let's talk a little bit about the other things on the topic uh, line today, which is uh, personalized news. Uh, there's a lot a lot of noise that RSS and mobile and GPS based systems can enable a very either hyper personalized or hyper localized news and. Those of us who've been in the television business for their whole lives will tell you that news is such an unbelievable commodity. Um, one would think that there wouldn't be a big business in in trying to even even to try getting more, even to try to be more efficient with a commodity item. But is there a, is there a business? I actually have an opinion. I'm not going to throw it. I want the panel to talk about. What, is there a business in citizen media? User generated, repurposed, hyper personalized. Is there a news business on, on the hyper personalized level using RSS and or mobile and or any other technology you might like? Well, well since that's, that is my business, I guess I better answer because otherwise I otherwise I should shut down and go home and find something else to do with my time. But um, <clears throat> what I believe is that communities are hyper specialized, which is say, you know, the news that is most compelling and important to me is going to be different than anyone else in this room. However, if you look out in the world of the billion people that are online, there is probably a cluster of people who share my particular perspective, the set of things that I'm interested in, the way I look at them. 
Um, what I believe is there is a business in allowing those communities to form and to allowing people to come together around the news that is important to them so that I can benefit from the other people's expertise where those people have a viewpoint that's similar to mine. So if I'm, I, I'm a dad, I have three girls, um, there are other dads out there with three girls. Uh, being a dad with three girls is different than being a dad with three boys. The kinds of things that those people are going to write and think about are going to be different. And to me, it's going to be the most important news. To you, if you have sons it might be, or no children at all, it's not going to be as interesting. And, uh, and so what I believe is there is a business in helping those people connect with each other uh, and helping them share their expertises and then helping them benefit from reading the news that is most important to them. And so, that is our business. So using the I pay, you pay, or someone else pays model. Well, actually, someone else pays. Advertising, I agree with Jason that adver advertising is the, is the business model for uh, internet distributed media and will be for some time to come. I should also mention, I was on a panel last week with uh, Debbie Gallant, who is the founder, editor in chief of one of these uh, hyper local news sites or place sites, whatever you want to call them, uh, called Baristanet.com. Oh, yeah. And she, uh, so, that, you know, basically, they cover three towns in northern New Jersey and they. They've started, you know, they've got like an ad server they just added, and they're starting to get some revenues. So they're generating about $8,000 a month uh, just for that one local community site. So I think, you know, if, you, if you've got your business model set up right, if you've got uh, the cost down, um, you know, it costs almost nothing to put up one of these sites now, um, other than your time and sweat, right? Um, that um, people will find a way to, to make a living out of it. Yeah, no, I'm sure that's true. We'll take some questions from the audience. You guys have been very quiet, so I'm going to ask a question. You're kidding. Come on, these guys are all outstanding. And here we go. So a lot of people with one person's opinion, and that's what you see. I'm really interested in collaborative creative, creative works. And two examples, and I think it's not so much creative, but what you see is, you know, many people's opinions still get convinced or do this last person's you know, that's the way it was, version of things. And another that I like is actually just um, uh, on Flickr, you know, on a keyboard in Ethiopia. You know, you get this amazing photo study of the place and the concept, especially if you're interested in this uh, filter. Can you talk about other works like that or other things that are happening? In that? So the question just for video is, are there, are there models like Wikipedia or Flickr with tag clouds and tag clusters that enable uh, collaborative and group creation and, of, and formation of content. Yeah, you know, there, there is a collaborative movie editing site. JD, I bet you know more about it than any of us. Oh, well. Well, that's what I was going <laughs> There's a bunch of enabling technologies that are out there that do stuff like Jump TV is a, a, a enabler. There's a bunch of sites that you can do that on. There's a music site called Rap. Oh, no, I'm going to forget it now. It's rapsomething.tv, and we can actually go float a loop and do your own rap song over it and get it out there immediately. It's kind of, um, there's a bunch of those tool enabling tool sets out there. But I don't think that was really the question. The question is, wiki is a collaborative kind of wiki. I don't, I don't know what else to call it. It's a, there is, because that is a very regulated environment, even though it's totally unregulated. I mean, those guys spend some quality time beating each other up and inventing and trying to rethink and redo. And there's a lot of guys who have dedicated way too much free time, dedicating an awful lot of time and energy to make a wiki as good as it can be. Um, I don't know if that's true in every circumstance, but I, you know, there's a, I don't know, I'm hoping, but I do not know where the collaborative thing goes, because ultimately they say a camel is a horse that was created by committee. There's a, uh, there's a definitive limit to where these collaborative things can go, um, and we're starting to see that in social news, you know, places like Dig and Reddit and Netscape really can only take you so far. Uh, and then you sort of get to the point where you have all the data in one place, and you have all the raw materials, and you're looking at it going, gee, the, this is the wisdom of the crowds? Great. And you're just not you know, that impressed, or it's, it's OK, it's good. So really what you have to look at is what happens after the wisdom of the crowds. And I think it's the sort of intelligence of the individual. And people, again, it's going to come full circle individuals taking the wisdom of the crowds and then making something out of that. So you're starting to see that with Wikipedia, people are going to start creating derivative works since it is a share and share like license. People taking things like Mozilla's code and creating Firefox on it and Flock on it in terms of browsers. And that, that's when it's going to really get interesting. Frankly, the wisdom of the crowds, it's nice. You'll discover some interesting things from it. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to 
rely on the intelligence and integrity of an individual than it is on the, the, the wisdom of the crowds. And I love, you know, sites like Netscape and Dig and Delicious and I run one of them, but uh, there is definitely a limitation, which is why we hired eight full-time citizen and traditional journalists to sit on top of that list and say, uh, gee, this story is patently false and was voted up by a bunch of, you know, uh, sock puppets and turn it off. Or, you know, put a warning on it that the story is under dispute. It really only gets you halfway down the field, the wisdom of crowds, and it's very overrated. Actually, if you want a, a phenomenal experience just for fun, any week you feel like it, go to Google Zeitgeist and look at the zeitgeist of Google searches compared to the things that interest you personally. If the disconnect is not like total, I would be surprised. Let me take just a slightly different direction here, uh, but in the spirit of collaboration, I think there's some interesting things that are happening in, in the field of collaborative reporting. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that we're involved with, we made a, a, a donation to Jay Rosen's uh, uh, new assignment on that, uh, with, with the idea that you use a community of reporters, uh, distributed reporting, uh, so that you can gather information in a way that no other, that no mainstream media organization could ever afford to do it. I was reading recently there was a, 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 an operation called, um, called uh, Project Sunlight in which the crowd essentially did research that found uh, probably 70 members of Congress uh, were employing their spouses at rather high rates of pay uh, in their, in their re-election campaigns, which may have something to do with the way the polls are going right now. Uh, but I think this, this kind of pro-am approach where you can use the, the strength of the crowds and the wisdom of an editor to make the story better uh, has, has a lot of future to it. I, th I think I mean, that's a good point. I think every, uh, every kind of well-known political blogger certainly that, that I've interacted with has said that, that there's a doubling or tripling or quadrupling effect of the resources of all of his, in this case, say, Talking Points Memo, of all of his readers who act as uh, de facto researchers and, and reporters for him to, to bring that up, allow him to accomplish something that he could never accomplish without that, and that it's, what it's done is, he's found, and you talked about this earlier, he's found this kind of zone of passion about what he does, and, and listed groups of people who previously had no other way to express their interest and their passion in this area, or even what, what a lot of people found as a knowledge base in an area, and, and contribute that knowledge base to, as you said, an editor or a journalist or someone who's, who's compiling it at all, but I, I think, um, you know, I, th I think, and again, this goes back to, to what you were talking about, that when people are able to find an express outlet for their passion, they'll find a way to contribute and find groups, uh, groups that are together. The, the, uh, the, the, the collaborative aspect of this is not, not that there's so much equality in two people making a particular project, but that there's a, a vast number of people participating in, in creating something that's essentially the product of the mind of one group of editors or or, or, or the case of it. So I, I just have a question for this group. Um, and we'll take one more, a couple more audience questions. In order for the technology to serve the constituency the best, one of the things you absolutely give up is, is privacy, in that your behaviors, uh, no one can, uh, no one's gonna give you a ton of information, but they'll act a certain way, and if you look at the way they act, what they read contextually, the way Google deals with your Gmail and throws up keyword instead of keyword ads up into Gmail. Um, and no matter how you look at it, there, there's a, some little bit of, I hate to call them civil rights, that's wrong. It, it, it's, it's some, privacy, it's just some little bit of privacy is given away. The more privacy you're willing to give away, the better the technology can serve you. The less privacy you're willing to give away, the less well the technology can serve you. And so collaborative filtering becomes uh, a question of exhibited behaviors uh, or things you tell the system, which you're never going to do. So could, could this group just talk to me a little bit about, about the role of privacy and the future of uh, distributing relevant content on a personal level? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's anything new, that by participating, you are giving up privacy. I'm not saying it's new, but it's new. The, 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 I mean, the thing about privacy is that 
it's, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's incredibly valuable, and I think people understand that it's more and more valuable, but that, that, that the, the thing that's so important is that there, there are hard and fast and concrete rules about privacy. If you do this, you give up this. If, it, this is what's not allowed to happen. And, the, uh, and I think that's why the privacy debate involving, say, NSA wiretapping is so interesting, because it, it, you, you, people, something that people thought wasn't happening was happening. And if there are very strict, hard and fast rules, like everyone knows if you go through a tunnel with an easy pass, they have you in the tunnel with the easy pass. So everybody who's you, everyone's that. Well, or, or it's widely you known. I mean, everyone, everyone, including me. I mean, many people, including me, have that. It's widely you known. There's, I think, I think it's widely you known that if one uses a credit card, that's almost gone out. If you watch Law and Order, you probably know this truth. Everybody, everybody right. watches Law and Order, right. including Noam Chomsky. And personal life, and how I run the different companies I work on, uh, the better my life has become. Actually, so actually, the more you give, I found, the more you get, and it's an absolute better way to live your life because then you have uh, you're very much in sync. Who you are, what you're doing, is very much in sync with the public perception of who you are, and, and people knowing that. So people knew exactly what we were doing at Web Loads Inc., exactly how we were doing it, down to releasing our AdSense revenue. And when you have that level of transparency, your life just gets so easy because people know exactly what you're doing. And it sort of gets back to that sort of, should I blog or not blog? And I go to lunch with people now, and they're, I don't need to explain anything that's going on in my life because they've read my blog. They know exactly where I'm at. And I'm like, so what are you up to? And they will reference you know, three blog posts I've done last month and I want to talk about those. But they already know my position on the issues. And it just makes it so easy. Um, so whenever I hear from like CEOs of companies or senior managers of companies that they don't blog because they don't have the time, I always just wonder like how could you not blog because it's so much more efficient in terms of communicating with people. When I write my blog posts, it's to my team, you know, sometimes business partners or people who are sort of affiliated to my competitors, you know, potential future investors, to advertisers, all my constituents, and it just works so brilliantly in, in saving time and communicating your message. It's, it's absolutely the best way to have a, uh, a business and to run a business is to be absolutely transparent. You know, I think, I think you know, we, we live in a liberal democracy where we can, and, and, and in a civil society, and so we can assume we're not, you know, there's no one standing outside this conference room waiting to kidnap Jason because they know he's wealthy and they know where he is. And, and that's it's like the fifth time you've talked about my wealth. You seem to be pretty obsessed about it. <laughs> I'm not because because you keep about it. I've never talked about it. I've never talked about my, my, my and it's Sorry. not like I'm like the founder of YouTube over here. Let's take another question from him. CC Kramer from Pay Content. Maria, not to pick on you, I'm really not trying to, but you asked, so I want to reference it. Um, a few years ago, uh, NPR ran into some problems over the issue of deep linking into its sites. And it strikes me that four years later, um, we've, we've come a long distance, and at the same time, there's still that kind of issue that JD brings up about how to, how to make it possible for your, your audience, for your your listeners to become part of the way your content is distributed. Um, so in, in answer to, to the question he raised earlier, the issue he raised earlier, is there a way that NPR can do this without um, without detracting from its number sites and actually adding to it? Without detracting, without detracting from its number sites, but actually adding to it by bringing, its, by bringing more people in? Well, I, I certainly think the answer to that is yes. I'm not sure what you mean by member sites. Um, is that what you said? Lo local affiliates. Yeah. Well, the, the issues, that, the two issues that you um, that you refer to, the, the deep linking issue, was frankly just stupid. Um, and you know, I think that you know, won't go into to all the issues around that. Uh, but and and I'm, I'm not. I'm also not sure. Um, what JD was referring to specifically, but that's a different, those two issues are both very different from, you're raising up a, a, an issue around the, the relationship that NPR has with its affiliates, so I think I would point out two things. One, if you look at public radio across the board, um, we have not been very smart about how we've moved on to the web. Uh, we basically have just taken the structure of the industry as it exists in radio and, and plopped it onto the web. It doesn't really make any sense in that way because you, as a listener, when you're listening to a radio station, a single stream that of, of radio, which is which is linear, 
Um, you may be hearing uh, programming coming from a lot of different places, and then we force you to sort of go to five different websites to find that programming or to interact with that programming or to donate or whatever you want to do to interact with, with your public radio station or your, or your NPR or however you think about it. Um, so we, we, we basically have replicated online a very fragmented industry that exists in radio, and that's, that's not working out very well. Um, so when you ask, is there a way to, to bring, you know, the, to bring the audience into NPR and to do that in such a way that benefits the affiliates, sure, I think there is. I think it's very, there are very clear way. It has to do with, you know, uh, establishing some type of federated identity, some type of federated search, so that all of you, when you're listening and you want to find things, would make it easier for you. Uh, establishing some sort of national. Uh, a database to track you so that if you're a public listener, public radio listener in Seattle, if you happen to move to New York, we don't completely lose you, which is what happens today. We're, we're simply, you know, as, as, a, as an industry, we have kind of had every vote on its own bottom. And that on radio is, is a distinctive advantage for us because we, we have uh, stations that are based in our communities and that are highly localized, and that's a distinctive advantage on radio. But online, it doesn't make sense. So I would just you know, wrap up my comments in response to me and say, I don't think we've done a very good job. But it's not just you. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a transition going on here where consumers themselves uh, are defining brands in ways that they always have, but now right in the face of the people who actually police the brands. And the companies that are taking advantage of the web, companies that are being uh, very diligent about reading the blogs that are out there, looking at communities of interest and understanding where third parties have come together and started to build new software that augments and, and, and somehow improves the, the software experience for the community or the, or the brand experience for the community. Those companies are prospering in ways that, that are really, truly extraordinary. And companies that are, for whatever reason, uh, unwilling or unable because of the way their businesses are set up, not able to pay attention to their consumers in that way, are, are suffering the consequences. I'd love to take more questions, but unfortunately we are out of time today. Uh, the panel will be around for a little bit. There's 10 or so minutes before the next panel. I want to thank uh, our panelists and maybe if we could just uh, we could just get one last word from each panelist about the subject, that would be fantastic. Uh, JD, just starting with you, like one fa favorite, cons favorite website and or thing people should be looking at. Uh, and then we'll just try and go straight down the line and call it a day. Okay, yeah. Um, for collaboration, there's a cool new P2P application called uh, Spin Express. And if you go to outthink.com with one T, you can download it. It's free. Uh, it, it solves the problem of if you've got a really cool video that you've created or, uh, or a piece of music and you're going to be collaborating with somebody across the country or across the world, you know, you can't really email it, right? So um, here's a P2P. Uh, private file sharing network that lets you uh, uh, collaborate and uh, exchange files legally. Uh, the two sites I've been playing with are my blog blog, which is uh, I'm not affiliated with. It's a site uh, run by Scott Rafer who did feeds before this that lets you create groups based on blogs. Uh, so it's sort of like MySpace for your blog. So if you're in the blog, if you have a big blog or whatever, you can go in there and you can see all the people who've added. Gawker or Gizmodo and Gadgets or Blogs. And the second one, which I am affiliated with, is called This Next, um, which Gordon Gould did in UPOC uh, and, and Workmate Southern Reporter uh, created. Uh, and it is a social shopping site. So you can go in there and put in what sort of products you like and don't like. And what's pretty interesting about it is um, over time, if you were the first person to put this phone in, you can sort of track how many um, times you were the first person to put something in and sort of, or at what point in the life cycle of a product you put it in to figure out if you are a tipping point. Sort of it's the manifestation of a tipping point, you know, like who put the stuff in first? Uh, and so it's called This Next, and it's really an interesting way to see who is creating trends. And my final thought is uh, authenticity is the currency of these systems, whether it's blogging or wikis or blogging. Authenticity. Great. For uh, conversations and reporting from parts of the world that are underreported on, uh, the conversations aren't normally heard. Global Voices Online, which is an organization I am affiliated with, uh, but I highly recommend it. Great. Yeah. 
I'd like to throw out a, a plug for dabble.com, which I think answers some of J.D. Laska's question about where do I, how do I find out about a video that uh, you know, the group of people that I know and trust would all think are good. It's a search engine that there's 200 uh, places out there that you can host video today. Uh, or, you know, very hard to go to every single one of them to find the thing that you really want and care about. And uh, Dabble provides a single point of entry to go and look at all of them and also see what other people have said about them. So it gives you a good, uh, good entree to that. And the other thing I would mention is, uh, is a book. You remember those? They're printed in paper. Yeah. Um, and it's called The History of News. And it's by Stephen Michaels. It's actually out of print. It's hard to find. It's a New York University professor. It came out in the mid 80s. Um, and so it doesn't benefit from the, the web at all. But it's a fantastic uh, summary of the history of the way in which citizen media has existed all the way back into uh, uh, you know, Egyptian, ancient, ancient Egypt. And so uh, it gives, gives you some perspective on what we're doing today. Sure. Uh, well, I really couldn't agree more that uh, authenticity, uh, <coughs> me, authenticity is, is, is the key. And um, I think what, one of the things we found is that when people are given the opportunity to authentically interact with uh, something they feel passionate about, um, w whether it's a cause or, 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 or anything else, they, that, you will, that, there, that there will be a massive amount of, um, of participation and, and uh, that that, that this whole media has given an incredible opportunity to give people direct access to things they feel passionate about. I and just actually got the hook from Victor himself, so we're, we're going to have to cut oh. this short. Can I just uh, real short. Quick? Uh -huh. I think it's a very interesting example going on in Minnesota right now in the Minnesota gubernatorial race. Uh, it is uh, being conducted with sort of a web 2.0 um, tools, edemocracy.org slash edebates. Well, thanks everybody very much. Really appreciate your coming. We'll see you uh, around campus.